the session is now being recorded. Uh, you can see that next to the microphone that's above the window, there's sort of a red icon and that indicates that it's being recorded. Uh, so having said that, I would uh, like to introduce the, our panel today. So I will let each one introduce yourselves and I'll introduce myself at the end. So perhaps we could start with uh, Kolo. Hello, everybody. Good good morning, good evening, and, and good afternoon. Um, my name is Kolofelo Kugler, and I work at the ACWL. And it's a pleasure for me to be uh, joining with you in this webinar. And I hope uh, that we learned a lot from this session. And also um, to tell you that uh, we will be organizing the one-on-one -on -one sessions. So if you're interested in having a, a more personalized, tailor-made experience of you know, Elsa and just generally how the, the mood court, the John H. Jackson mood court works, uh, please do sign up and let us know. Um, so looking forward to, to working with you. Thanks so much, Kolo. I would now invite Svetlana to introduce yourself. Oh, hi, everyone. My name is Svetlana Chubanova. I work at the WTO. Uh, Previously and for years, I have been part of the appellate board secretariat, so experience with dispute settlement, and I'm very glad to be here with you. And I hope well, we're both going to enjoy this session, and we're going to learn a lot. Thanks so much, Svetlana. So I now turn the floor to Jakub. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is. of the uh, 18th edition of John Ajax Mutko competition. And I will walk you through Thanks so much, Jakub. And now I would ask Louis to introduce yourself, please. Hello, everyone. I hope my mic is working this time. Uh, my name is Louis Bremont, and I'm the organizer of the 19th edition of the John Jackson Mutko competition and the vice president in charge of Mutko competition for the international. Thanks so much, Louis. Uh, although Saweria is not speaking today, I think that her hard work and contribution for this session to happen and for the competition to happen warrants uh, Saweria, perhaps, if you don't mind, just to introduce yourself briefly to be Yes, I'm happy to. Um, good morning, good afternoon. I'm Saweria Mwangi. I work as a dispute settlement lawyer at the WTO, and um, I have uh, also, together with everyone on the panel, been working on the Elsa Mood Court. I look forward to interacting with you and to um, connecting with you in the one-on-one -on -one sessions later. Thank you. Thanks so much, Saweria. So uh, my name is Miguel Villamizar. Uh, I, as Saweria, work as a dispute settlement lawyer at the Secretariat of the World Trade Organization. And I welcome you to this workshop for coaches in the John H. Jackson Mood Board competition on WTO law. Uh, this event is organized by the Advisory Center on WTO Law, here represented by Colofello, uh, uh, the World Trade Organization, and ELSA, which is the European Law Students Association. So uh, I would only ask, well, sort of make another housekeeping notice, which is that we have reserved time for a Q&A session towards the end of the presentation. So I invite you to make your questions through the Q&A box that you have available at the bottom uh, of your screen on the right side. Uh, there you can direct the questions directly to a specific panelist or to all if you want it to be addressed by several. And if you prefer to present the question uh, orally, just uh, raise your hand. I'll keep track on who raises their hand and I will grant you the floor by making you a panelist as we are uh, for the time you make the question, and then I'll bring you back to being an attendee again, and you can present yourself uh, and the question, of course. <laughs> and just bear in mind that the session is being recorded, so if you don't want to appear on camera, uh, well, then just use the option of the written questions. Uh, we are hoping to be able to share the recording with you uh, through different media. Uh, we will, of course, inform you uh, where you can find it afterwards so that you can revisit it or share it with other ones who might be interested. So without further ado, I would yield the floor to uh, Jakub and Louis. I don't know who of you is going to speak first, but just to uh, take on board um, the presentation of the competition itself. 
Yes. Uh, so I think I will start. Maybe, uh, Miguel, you can uh, go to another slide or Svetlana. I don't know who is uh, in charge of the presentation. So. Sorry, Jakub, to interrupt a second before we move on, before we move into your point. Uh, well, yeah, exactly. So we'll start with uh, the presentation of the mood court. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so as I said uh, in my introduction, rules of the competition, um, and I would, uh, I would start with the one that is, I would say, the most uh, basic one, and that one is that the overall responsibility of the organization of the competition lays on Alza in is providing it to the competition. Um, also, uh, academic board is uh, the body that is supporting uh, ELSA International and the whole competition, especially in regards to academics. So, for example, reviewing um, the case um, and all the case proposals, uh, then of uh, uh, the written submission, selecting the panelists uh, and everything in this regard. Uh, another part is rules, uh, so we are every year uh, going through the rules and we are trying to update them. Uh, we all have experience during during each edition and then we are trying to uh, give it to our successors to maybe make some changes. So this is something that Academic Board helps us with as well. And again, and the last part would be uh, I would say also fundraising uh, part, uh, but that is not participation. So I think I can factor of the competition. Um, the competition uh, is composed from, all, I would say, three big submissions uh, uh, and five rounds. Uh, a bit later, but I think uh, before all uh, phases come in force, you need to first register your uh, start preparing for the competition. So I think this is something that is very important uh, for the building of the team. So basically, what you need to know is for you to register the team, you need to have a uh, university or law faculty located in the member state of ELSA or a current or uh, exceeding uh, members or observers of WTO. Uh, there shall be only one team per university or law faculty. Um, so uh, I think this is pretty clear what we did uh, last year. We specified it even more. So, for example, if your faculty has, or if your university has two law faculties or two faculties that could actually participate in the competition, uh, there is, uh, we allow uh, more teams from the university in this case. Uh, in each team, uh, there should be from two to four law uh, students. Uh, these, uh, these. Um, Students should be uh, should be in university uh, from the same university. Of course, from this rule uh, can be from each of these rules can be made an except, exemption if you uh, send an email to the uh, to Elsa International, so to Louis, and he will of course discuss with WTO and with the academic board, uh, and then of course inform you if. Uh, if, for example, uh, you can uh, maybe slightly uh, do something different that they said in the rules. Um, so the law faculty in university has to be awarding a law degree and not a doctoral uh, program. So uh, uh, yes, uh, in the uh, after the registration, of course. Uh, then ELSA International will be sending you uh, the invoice to pay the registration fee and also sending you uh, the allocation to the regional round. 
Of course, before uh, the participation in the regional run, there is going to be deadline for the written submissions that is usually around one month after the end of the registration period. So uh, what I would also suggest is to start already working on your written submissions after your registration so you have enough time to uh, to prepare um, and have everything ready by the uh, by the deadline uh, because uh, <clears throat> written submissions are extremely important, uh, especially when you uh, go to the regional round. In the preliminary rounds of the regional rounds, the course from written uh, submissions um, uh, are used, and uh, it depends. Uh, they are they are calculated together from the point from the oral pleading. So. Uh, so it is a very important part of the mood, and you should uh, you should focus very much on that as well. So this is uh, to written submissions. Also, every written submission is always written submission is always um, uh, there is two uh, independent panelists going through uh, through every uh, written submission. So we can also ensure that. Uh, uh, that everything is fair, um, and uh, I believe that is all to written submissions. I think in the rules you can uh, you can see uh, further instructions like size paper and font and font size and everything. Uh, but uh, but I am not going to go through every everything like that because we would spend here another uh, another two hours. Um, in regard to the oral pleadings and the regional rounds, as I said, uh, you will receive the allocation. Uh, where are you going to the regional round, especially in regards to the European round, uh, because they are uh, they are split in regards to the to the rest of the rounds. It, it usually worked. Uh, for example, when your team is from Asia, you are automatically going to the Asian round, so there is no need to be uh, there is no need. To have the allocation list, it's usually used for the European rounds. Um, in the in the oral pleadings, uh, basic rules are uh, each team has to plead uh, as a uh, complainant, as a respondent. So during the preliminary rounds, one day you plead as a complainant, on another day you plead as a as respondent. Each team uh, has 45 minutes. Uh, of uh, of pleading and plus to this 45, you have five minutes to present their, uh, your uh, rebuttal and the rebuttal. Uh, each uh, speaker should have uh, 25 minutes maximum. So, for example, when your team has uh, two speakers, uh, one of them cannot have more than 25 minutes. Uh, the minimum is again uh, is also uh, uh, seven minutes. So yes, maximum twenty five and minimum seven. So you can be also uh, uh, part of the process with all the all the uh, awards and uh, and everything. Also, you may uh, ask for the. Um, for the extension of the of the time, so but this is also going to go further in this uh, in these minutes because I know how confusing it is, so it's easier for you to read it from there. And if you have any questions uh, to ask uh, Louis, and he will definitely explain everything. Uh, from each region around, it's up to Elsa International how many teams will proceed to the final all round. So it usually depends on how many teams uh, there is in the region around. Uh, of course, if there is one region around with 15 teams and then other region around with 10 teams, there is going to be more teams from the region around where the 15 teams proceeding to the final all round than, uh, than from the one where is only 10 teams. So this is also will be depending on um, on how many teams in each region around there is. So I cannot tell you for sure that from each region around it's four teams because it changes every year. Um, usually during region around, there is preliminary round, then semifinals and uh, and grand final. Uh, 
but again this also depends on the number of teams if the if the number of teams would uh pass some some number uh there should also uh be uh quarterfinals quarterfinals are usually are, are for sure done uh in the final all round uh i hope that the final all round uh will uh next year uh take place in geneva unfortunately during uh during my year as you could uh, as you probably know we had to organize it virtually but let's hope that uh that everything will work out uh for the next edition uh and yes the the final round is usually organized in uh in june uh as you can see in the presentation uh in late june uh 2021 for this edition and uh for the for the region around it's usually, I would say, also there can be some regional runs that are already in February. So I would say between February, March, and April. Uh, of course, this will also depend uh, a lot on the on the situation with uh, with the COVID-19 outbreak. But this is something that Louis will be talking, I would say, more about. Uh, yes, I think that this is. This is also the basic uh, basic rules and basic uh, course of the competition, I would say. Of course, if you have any question in, re in regards to this, uh, I will be here. So during the Q&A session, you can ask me. But of course, also, uh, Louis will be there uh, the whole year. So if you will have any questions in regards to the rules uh, or anything, uh, just uh, send, uh, uh, send him the email. And I think now, Louis, you can uh, you can take the floor. Thanks a lot, Jakub. Thanks a lot. So yeah, Jakub explained a bit the grounds of the of the rules and the basics. I will go more about the news about the next edition. Uh, so as he said, if you want to send me a mail to ask me any kind of question, you can find my contact on the website. Uh, on the website, you will also find the rules and all the material that you could need uh, to prepare the teams for the edition. These materials will be updated on the 15th of September 2020, which will be the launch of the competition. Uh, so on the 15th, you will have the new rules because the rules will be updated. What Jakob said will be the ground because it's the tradition of the competition, but still some slightly improvement changes will be made and you will find it on the, on the website. Uh, also, we created a LinkedIn page for the competition to update you and to update everyone that could be interested to social media. I know that it can be more interesting and more easy for some people to follow that. Uh, so yeah, this is for the changes and for the launch. It will start on the 15th of September. You can see the deadline, um, the, the deadline for, for the application will be at the very beginning of December. So this is the, the, the moment in which you can register your team and, and, uh, and be part of the competition. Um, for the original rounds and uh, the, the final round, you can see that the, the, line, uh, the, um, the timeline is in the presentation. However, as you know, there is now we are facing a, a outbreak of COVID-19 that kind of we had to adapt, let's say, during the previous edition, what my predecessor did splendidly. Um, hopefully, uh, we will be able to go for in-person edition. However, I want to state that uh, as the organizers, we are ready to to adapt at any moment so we are creating like the plan a and the plan b and even if the situation is sadly um, getting more complicated we will be able to adapt and the edition will still uh, happen once again so this is for that um for the prices because i think it's an information that can be important for you for the um for the registration of the teams uh the cost will be 250 euros per teams uh, so it's including like the whole the whole process of registration. There will be a second fee uh, for the regional round that will be up to the organizers or the organizers of the regional rounds. And the last one will be for the final round uh, in case of uh, the success of the team during the regional rounds. Um, about the changes of the rules, uh, as I said, you will be able to find everything uh, in the website. But there will also be uh, the new guidelines uh, that will help you to construct the submission, the right to submission, and also to be ready and to train for the oral submissions. So you can find a lot of material on the website. You will, there is the link uh, in the presentation to the website and we'll share it again. Um, I think it's good for the material that you can use. There is also the material from the previous editions, 
which means uh, the um, the um, uh, all the former materials, so the cases, uh, the final report of the competition that you can find there and can help you a lot and uh, to, to see a bit better what it will be and what it is to participate in, in, in this Modcode competition. I think I tackled uh, the vast majority of the points that I wanted to tackle. So if you have any question, as, as said Jacob, you can either ask it now or during the, during the, the, the Q&A session, or you can send me a mail. Uh, the mail is modcodes uh, at elza.org. You can find this mail address on the website in the part contact and I um, feel like feel free to, to send me any, any mail or any question. Thanks so much, Jakob and Louis. Uh, and now Svetlana is going to continue with the presentation. Uh, the next topic. So Svetlana, over to you. Thank you, Miguel. All right, hi everyone again. Uh, so I'm just going to go back to the previous slide. Um, as the overview for today, so we already heard about the, an introduction to the Jackson Mood uh, by Jakub and Lui, and then I'm going to talk to you now about the WTO agreements, what are the WTO agreements that are covered by the competition, uh, what are the sources of WTO law and what's the interpretation of WTO law, like the general framework of that. And I'm going to introduce some research tools to you. Now, this presentation is going to be sent over to you. So all the links that are within the presentation will be available to you. So don't try to memorize everything for writing down. That's not necessary. And then my colleagues, uh, Miguel and Colofello, are going to take over with some tips for mood code best practices for the written and the oral part of the competition. OK, so to go on. Um, and this is a nice photo of how the oral round would be looking. So this is one of the conference rooms at the WTO. And actually, it looks very, very similar to how normal panel and developer body hearings are conducted. There are no timekeepers there, but otherwise, and maybe the delegates are a little bit older, but otherwise it looks pretty much the same. <laughs> All right. So to begin with, uh, I want to do just a small introduction of what are these agreements that are going to be covered uh, by the Jackson Mood. And these are the so-called agreements uh, included in the Marrakesh Agreement establishing the World Trade Organization. There are two big groups. The most important, the more important and comprehensive one are the multilateral trade agreements. And these are the agreements that are applicable to all 164 members of the WTO. So everybody that's a member of the WTO should apply these agreements. Now, to begin with, uh, we have Annex 1A uh, that refers to the multilateral trade agreements on trade in goods. And sort of the more basic one is the GATT 1994. What it comprises is to begin with GATT 1947. So GATT is the general agreement on tariffs and trade. And the 1947 is already the essential part of this agreement that was agreed by members back in 1947. So after the Second World War and there the agenda was a little bit more uh, ambitious. So at that point, members um, led by the uh, United States wanted to create the so-called international trade organization uh, based on international trade agreement or an ITA. Uh, and the GATT 1947 with these rules on trading goods, tariff and non-tariff barriers were supposed to be part of this agreement of this new organization. What happened eventually was that this agreement started being applied provisionally pending the approval procedures for the ITA, for the International Trade Organization, which never came to being. It was never implemented. So in reality, what happened was that this agreement existed from 14, uh, 1948 to 1995 in itself without an organization, but in a very practical way, a secretariat was developed around it so that it can serve the agreement. So these were the basic rules for trading goods amongst nations before the creation of the WTO, the World Trade Organization, in 1995. So that was when all these other agreements also were agreed as a result of the Uruguay round negotiations. And 
again, now we refer to the GATT 1994, but this includes the basic rules and the bulk of them remain unchanged. From the GATT 1947, also the legal instruments that were adopted under that agreement, six new understandings on the provision of the GATT 1994, again agreed at that point, and the market protocol to the GATT. Now, in addition to the GATT, another 12 agreements supplementing the GATT 1994 were agreed at that point, at the point of creation of the WTO. And these agreements are also listed in Annex 1A to the agreement establishing the WTO. So you will see that one or more of these agreements will most probably be covered by the case that would, uh, that would come up. Uh, next year, for the next edition, for instance, last edition concerned the agreement uh, on the application of the sanitary and phytosanitary measures, the SPS agreement, and certain other provisions of the GATT 94. Uh, but any of those agreements can also uh, be part of your moot case. Now, in addition to Annex 1A to the agreement on trading goods, you have Annex 1B, which is the agreement on trading services, the so-called GATT. And finally, Annex 1C, which is a TRIPS agreement, that, uh, an agreement that uh, creates minimum rules on uh, intellectual property rights. Right, so in addition to these substantive trade agreements, then you have further down here, the understanding of the rules and procedures governing the settlement of disputes, so-called DSU for short. This is a very important agreement for you because as it says actually, in its title, it creates the, it explains the rules and procedures that govern the dispute settlement system. So these are the main principles of the dispute settlement system, some rules on interpretation, on the functioning, rules on panel procedure, rules on appeal after a case is, uh, after a panel report is rendered, it could be appealed before the appellate body. And finally, some rules on implementation of these reports. So how are members that are found to be the rules are found to be inconsistent with WHO rules. How should they amend them? What should they do? And how should this be followed up by the members of the organization? And finally, there is an Annex C that talks about a little bit less relevant, but again, depends on the case. Maybe trade policy review mechanism. These are procedural rules on policy, on reviews, periodic reviews of member, WTO members' policies, trade policies. So this is a transparency exercise that is very important so that the WTO membership would uh, follow, um, would follow up and would understand uh, the trade rules of other members. All these rules that we talked about, and they're like in darker blue uh, on the slide, they apply, as I said, to all WTO members. There are certain other agreements, and currently just two of them are in force. So this is the agreement on civil aircraft and the agreement on government procurement that are only applicable to their signatories. And these are not all the WTO members. So only certain members that have signed and um, followed the procedures under these agreements um, have these agreements applicable to them. So these are the so-called covered agreements by the WTO. And now, what are the sources of WTO law and its interpretation? So how do we interpret? How do we approach this exercise? To begin with, the sources of WTO are obviously the WTO agreements, as we just explained. It's explained. Um, another important source of uh, WTO law and sort of a tool for its interpretation, rather, have become the panel reports and the appellate body reports. Now, it's important to mention that these reports are they're part of the rendered by panels and the appellate body is part of the dispute settlement understanding its rules. There, these reports are only um, applicable to the parties uh, to the, of the disputes. So if the dispute is between the European Union and the United States, obviously the panel report would only apply between these two parties. However, they include important interpretations of certain rules, certain agreements of uh, the WTO, which have become a very strong persuasive source for their interpretation. And then they ensure uh, predictability, consistency and predictability in the interpretation of the rules. So say if Article 3 of the, WG, of the um, GATT is interpreted in a certain way in an appellate body report, the assumption is that in subsequent panel and appellate body reports, in order to ensure 
predictability of how rules would be interpreted, the same interpretation would be kept. Hence, um, it is an important also source of information for you should you have final or better appellate body reports on the topic and the specific rules that would be in the mood case for next edition. There is the so-called negotiating history of the WTO uh, rules as well. That should be taken with a pinch of salt and carefully looked at. It's indeed very interesting source uh, in case you don't have clear rules or in case the interpretation of the text itself uh, is contradictory or unclear. However, there is no official negotiating history of the WTO rules, so there is nothing written and agreed by all members, okay, this is what happened during the negotiations. Rather, there is a collection of documents that uh, reflect the minutes of the meetings of the different bodies, so they give a very interesting perspective on how a certain rule developed over time, how it was revised over time by the, the negotiators, and what was the final agreed text. However, its value would not trump the text of the agreement itself. So if there is a clear agreement, clear uh, interpretation of the text, then you can go, you cannot use the negotiating history to say, well, yes, but they meant something else. Right, but this is something I'm sure you're going to read more about uh, if it comes to that. And finally, an important source of interpretation of WTO rules are also the writings of recognized scholars. You will see that on many topics, even if you don't have any jurisprudence yet, or even if you do, uh, there are uh, a lot of articles, books written on certain topics that would be extremely helpful, persuasive source of information. Of course, you cannot write, oh, Professor Mavridi said that, so that's the interpretation of certain provision. But of course, the reasoning in those articles is very, very important. Um, and just to follow up on this, um, the sources of WTO law are the WTO agreements and the legal text. So you should definitely start with the interpretation of the text, its context, its uh, putting the context of the aim of the WTO agreement. And then secondly, you should look at whether there are any, there's any jurisprudence on the topic, are there appellate body decisions, are uh, reports, sorry, are there any final reports? Further on, if you have looked at that and the interpretation still remains unclear and you have doubts, and of course, depending what your position is, whether you're a complainant or respondent uh, in the case, you can further look into the negotiating history. And finally, and I would very much encourage you to do so, you should definitely look at uh, writings of recognized scholars, uh, so articles and books written on the topic in order to better understand the context um, also of, uh, of the rule and uh, its application. So this is on the source of WTO law and their interpretation. Uh, if you have any questions a little bit later, this is a very broad overview, but I encourage you to ask questions either here or again to uh, sign up for one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions. We'll be happy to entertain further any questions on the topic. And I will move on uh, to the tools on the internet and certain publications that you could use exactly in order to arrive at this interpretation that we talked about. So to begin with, we said, to begin with, we said the agreements are the starting point. So what are the rules? And here, uh, the WTO website is very useful. So um, the WTO agreements you can find on the WTO website. Um, and in general, WTO website is a great source of information. You should just know how to use it. And I think we're going to give you already some tools here. Uh, it would be very, very helpful for your research. So here you have the legal text. If you scroll further down the page, as we discussed, we have Annex 1A, so agree multilateral agreements on trading goods, which we just discussed. Also certain instruments that have been agreed on under these agreements, under the GATT. Um, the rest of the agreements, Annex 1B, GATTs, TRIPS, etc. The dispute settlement understanding the plurilateral agreements, etc., And then you have other instruments, ministerial decisions and declarations that, depending on the topic that you have, would further be interesting and could be applicable to you. Uh, right. So then another source of information would be the schedules of the goods and services on the WTO website. I'm just going to open those to show you how it looks. 
So these are the agreed uh, tariff bindings for each WTO member on each um, for each product. So voila, these are regularly updated, and um, here you can see basically the good schedule for each WTO member, the bound tariffs, um, other tariff data, etc., tariff profile for each WTO member. That could be also helpful. Um, in your research, because these schedules of the books form an integral part and of services form an integral part of the WTO agreement. And then finally, protocols of accession. Uh, again, these protocols of accessions are for the members that are not the original members of the WTO, so each of them accedes uh, at a different, has acceded at a different uh, point in time with their own protocols, which have different rules. So you could have slightly different rules um, amongst members, and this could be also an important point of reference that you would uh, could check out. All right, uh, to continue with, again, the WTO website has a great research tool, um, I think, on the WTO jurisprudence, this is panel and uh, appellate body decisions. So, for instance, you can research cases let me close these things already. Right, so here you have a chronological list of disputes. So first of all, you can enter the DS number. For instance, if you know it, so each uh, WTO case has a DS number, dispute settlement number. Um, and here you have the chronological list of all cases. So this is the reverse chronological, starting with the last one. Not everywhere you'd have a, a report. Some um, some cases are still in consultations, and here you can see the status, current status, and when the consultations were requested. So the parties need to consult before the case advances, etc. And if you scroll further down, obviously you you see you have a huge list, and then um, later on panel is composed, or panel report could be issued, it could be on appeal, etc. Now, here on the left hand side, you could also use this uh, to arrange the cases uh, by, for instance, WTO agreement. I think this is useful. For instance, you get all the, the cases that mention the um, SPS agreement. And then you get only those. And you start from there. Um, you could arrange them by subject, you could arrange them by short title, you could have a dispute map, for instance, where it shows you from which to which member um, the disputes uh, are directed. Uh, you could have dispute report citations, uh, statistics, which could be also very useful, etc. Uh, by subject could be perhaps one interesting thing I have to mention, but definitely like I encourage you to um, to look at this. So by subject, this is very often the product which is concerned by the um, by the report. So for instance, GMOs, and then you have all the cases that relate to GMOs, etc. So interesting research tool, as I said. Um, you also have the so-called WTO docs online. This is helpful when you're looking for a specific document or you want to search a specific word. So here you could click, I don't know if you saw here on top, I clicked on search. And then you have this search form. And you, you can enter the document symbol. So all the, the WTO decisions will start with WTDS something. So for instance, we put the asterisk if you want to, uh, if you want to, to have more than one, or we just include one, four, three, seven, for instance. And then we would get all the documents for for DS four three seven. And I put it wrong. That's why nothing is shown. But I think I put one more symbol than necessary. So it's WTDS four three seven. I'm gonna now to work. Right, and here you have all the documents that are publicly available, unrestricted, and um, related to this case. So, first document would always be, for instance, the request for consultations, because this is a case between China and the US. 
somewhere further down the line, you have a document where the pilot body report is, but also other kinds of uh, documents like submissions by the parties. Well, submissions by the parties, no, but communications by the panel, um, requests for establishment, requests for consultations, etc. Now, another thing you could do is going back. Another thing you could do is do full search, full text search criteria. Um, I'm not sure this would work, but let's see and let's see who does criteria fish. And then you might that mention this text inside, something like this. Yeah. Um, Fish fillets from Vietnam. That might uh, that might be a big, big sort of not very narrow down research, but this is something you can also play with and see what results come out. So right, so this is the WTO docs online. Another tool on the WTO website is this WTO analytical index, which is basically a very helpful index prepared by um, by the legal divisions, and it's a guide on WTO law and practice. It has been recently updated and I find it very user friendly. So again, here you go by agreement. So and uh, you can choose the article you're looking for. So article three, for instance, is the national treatment provision. And then you can look for jurisprudence. And also if there is a WTO practice by WTO, uh, by WTO bodies. Jurisprudence will take you to excerpts from panels and appellate body reports that are relevant to this practice, uh, to this provision. So, as you see, for instance, here this is Article 3, it's a long article. You have the text of the article, and then scrolling further down, you have excerpts from different panel and appellate body reports, uh, which are the most important excerpts, let's say, of what the panels and the appellate body has said on the subject. Also very useful. Um, another page that directs you to all appellate body reports uh, in a chronological order. You can also find them through the Trade Dispute Gateway. Uh, and finally, another tool similar uh, to the analytical index is the appellate body repertory. It also gives you on appellate body reports. And uh, these are also excerpts from the most important statements made by the appellate body in certain, in certain um, areas. And they are grouped in a different way. They're normally grouped by subject. So for instance, everything that relates to the good faith that has been said the appellate body or everything that relates to article 11 which is review of facts by panels uh, and again these are ex excerpts that would be very helpful i would very much encourage you once you have found the, once you have found the relevant excerpts to go and read the entire panel or appellate body report so that you know what the context is of course right um and finally if you want to be looking at GATT dispute settlement reports, so these reports from GATT panels before 1995. So as we said, the general agreement on tariffs and trade exists as of 1948. So there was a dispute settlement system that didn't have an appellate body back then. It was a little bit more political, less, um, less judicial, let's say, than it is now. Uh, but there are interesting appellate, uh, panel reports uh, on uh, from the gap times that also um, research here. Now we have a new tool that is being developed that is a little bit more user friendly and interesting to explore than this page. Uh, however, it's still in the in the stages of, of like late development. It should be published pretty soon, and I think you should be looking at the WTO page for sure. There's going to be a big announcement once it's fully online. And this could be very helpful for you as well. Right. Okay. So moving on, just to mention, we would be sending you, given the format here and the fact that there are a lot of attendees, we can't do right now exercises with each one of you collectively. 
but uh, we will be sending you some exercises for homework and if you have the time and uh, uh, and if you would like to, you could send us back the answers and then we'll provide you with the correct answers. So I think Miguel will probably tell you a little bit more on that. All right, and now to continue a little bit with the research tools, uh, we are at jurisprudence. We saw what we can see on the WTO website. Now, besides the WTO website, there are some other internet-based tools that could be quite useful. The first one is the World Trade Law Net. It has two parts of it. Some of it is free, and it contains the cases and the legal text. Uh, it has a free resource library. It has trade news. Uh, and this so-called IELP blog, which I would encourage you to follow because it actually has pretty much uh, pretty interesting discussions in very uh, current subjects that are of interest to WTO jurisprudence. And then part of it is actually closed uh, and is only available upon subscription. Now, some of these tools could be available to your university, some may not be. Um, you may want to check and see if one of those would be useful for you and you would like to inquire at the possibility for to subscribe to it. So World uh, Trade Law Net looks like this. Uh, yes, well, please yes. go ahead. Sadlana, so, uh, actually, I would like to make a contribution there. So, actually, um, a few years ago, um, I managed to get WorldTradeLaw.net to get subscription, a limited time subscription for for a team that I was coaching uh, from a developing country. And so, if that is your circumstance, if you're a university in an in an LDC or developing country, uh, you can reach out to them, and and they've been very, very kind and generous. Um, so if you do want access to this to this resource, um, don't hesitate. They've got their, their contact details there. If not, you can reach out to me and I can um, give you the email address. So they're very, very, very generous and uh, you can get, gain access to this whole website for a limited time for the mood court. That is great. Thank you. That's, that's great to know. So don't hesitate to do that. Now, um, I am unfortunately from my in home office right now, so I don't have access to the paid part. But what is interesting here, I think, from the part that you need to subscribe to is the dispute settlement commentaries, so the, these DSCs. Uh, and you have dispute settlement commentaries for panel and appellate body reports. So these are summaries followed by short commentaries of the panel and appellate body appellate body report. And there are also some interesting statistics. I'm not sure how helpful they will be for your purposes, but basically it's interesting again here up is the IELP blog. This is free of charge. You can always follow it and read on the topics. I think it has a search tool so you could also filter through those um, discussions that are more relevant for your purposes. Um, right. So then the next uh, search tool uh, is the tradelawguide.com and uh, this is subscription only again perhaps check where they have some, uh, more favorable subscription conditions for developing countries etc again i won't be able to enter the paid version of it but it is a great uh, research tool i have to say i mean you can read some testimonials here uh, maybe there is a short description. There is a database overview, so you can read that and see what it has. What is interesting about it specifically, like it has uh, commentaries, jurisprudence, these two documents, but these are things that you can mostly find also on the WTO website of the negotiating history. But it, it has the so-called annotated agreements and text. And this is a very good tool because basically it has each agreement and each provision of the agreement annotated you can click basically on links directing you to jurisprudence to appellate body decisions and panel decision and, and excerpts from these decisions that are relevant for this particular provision so it's quite exhaustive and it's quite interactive it has a great search tool uh, so if anything uh, i would uh, try to see what are the subscription conditions for a trade law guide I think it makes your life easier in some in some ways, ours as well. <laughs> uh, and it has terms and phrases search as well. Yes. And finally, there is this WTO case law project. It has disputes and articles. 
um, as of 2001, so it's not complete. It's a project of the European University Institute in Florence. Very good one, but it's still in, in the process of development. So as you can see, ongoing since 20, uh, 20, uh, 2001. And uh, it has basically um, publications related to, um, to, 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 to certain um, panel and develop the report. You can also try to explore it and see whether it's uh, whether it's relevant for your purposes, but it's a good collection of um, articles, so it could be quite interesting as well. Um, right, and finally, as we said, the entire exercise of um, interpreting WTO law starts with the text. Now you will see when you start reading uh, or your students start reading WTO uh, decisions, uh, panel and fellow body reports, that uh, very often panels and fellow bodies start interpreting, especially a provision that hasn't been interpreted before, with the ordinary meaning of the terms in the text, and then reference is made often to dictionaries and what is this ordinary meaning in the dictionaries. So you could use the Oxford dictionaries that are free uh, through lexico.com or the Merriam Webster dictionary as well. And uh, there is also Stanford um, collection and WTO negotiating history. Um, again, this is actually something that we're trying to do in a better way within the WTO, but it's not available as of yet. Hopefully, as of the autumn, you'll be able to use it. But uh, this is the digital library of all the gaps documents, so in the period between 47 and 90. Okay, um, finally, turning to the publications and academic writings related to WTO law and jurisprudence. There are several things that we would encourage you to use, and uh, starting with the handbook on the WTO dispute settlement system. This is a very useful, short, concise, but full book uh, that is actually created by, by us, by my colleagues uh, that are working on uh, WTO disputes. So it's a first hand source of information. And it, uh, it has been updated in 2017, I think. Uh, it's explains the workings of the system on a day-to-day -day basis, so describe the rules and procedures, but also how they have been implemented, how they have been interpreted in the context of dispute settlement, how they have evolved over time. The book has to be purchased in its English version, and it's available online, so if you switch here at the upper left corner to French, then it's actually the PDF version of the book is available here you can um, you can download the entire book. For the English version, it has to be purchased though. Um, moving on, there are the online articles on WorldTrade.net. Uh, trade law, trade this is one of the um, free of charge features and. You can see basically there is also a collection of articles by different authors, WTO topics. I wonder if you could search. I think you can search by author only. But uh, voila, that's also one source of um, WTO um, related articles. We would suggest that you may want to start with the basic WTO law textbooks. Now, differently from the articles and differently from the handbook on WTO dispute settlement, it might not be that practical. And when you when you prepare for the moot court, sometimes you have to go really in depth. So basically, really get to the bottom of it. But a good starting source, which would give you a very good overview of a certain um, agreement, of a certain provision in that agreement, are these WTO law books. So what we have suggested here is the one by Peter van den Bosch and on uh, the law and policy of the WTO. You have Mitsuo Matsushita's uh, and others, that was Mudridis, that have another one on the WTO. Um, both have their uh, quality, so I wouldn't recommend one or the other. And then you have uh, Graham Cook's Digest of WTO Jurisprudence, 
um, on public international law concepts and principles, also very good. Graham Cook is one of our colleagues as well, uh, so we can recommend it. And then, of course, moving on further, I'm sure that your universities have subscriptions to specialized journals, uh, like the Journal of International Economic Law, WTO Trade Law Review, uh, etc. So there is a list also on World Trade Law Net of those uh, journals. Right, and so I think this is more or less a broad overview of the agreements and the tools that you would be using. Uh, I hope that's help helpful and again, looking forward to your questions. And now I'm going to give the word back to Miguel. Thanks so much, Svetlana, for uh, the very useful walkthrough of the different tools that are available. Uh, just a small comment in complementing what Svetlana just shared with you. Uh, Normally, each year, the case author provides a list of suggested bibliography, so you can find, uh, well, you will most certainly find one for this year's case once it's launched. Uh, and you can also go back to the previous cases, as uh, Louis mentioned, and Jakub, there's a very good repository of information in Elsa's website of prior editions of the competition. And in the cases, you might find additional bibliography that could help you navigate who are uh, sort of uh, renowned authors who have written about different subjects that may be relevant for the case or for you to grasp a better understanding of how WTO law works. So uh, having said that, I will now move on to the second part or third part actually of our presentation, which concerns the best practices uh, for this competition. Uh, just to share with you, I have been a coach of this competition three times in the past. Uh, I personally didn't compete in the competition as a participant, but I participated in another one, which is the uh, Philip C. Jessup Wood Court. Some of you might have heard of it. And partly that experience really made an impact in, on myself and it got me into loving international law. And it was sort of a starting point for me to gear towards uh, WTO law. So I'm quite passionate about this and I'm happy to share a bit with you uh, what I did with some of the teams and how it worked or not. So we have first some uh, general advice for you. So the first thing is to be familiar with the rules of the competition. Here's a link to the rules. I think we don't need to go there right now, but it's in the presentation in case you want to go there. It's to the rules from the prior edition. So we recommend, as Luke was saying, that the rules are undergoing a review process. So a new set of rules will be published in due course. So please uh, consult ELSA's webpage uh, frequently so that you are aware that you're looking at the right version of the rules. You don't want to be uh, participating on the basis of what was in force and it no longer is. Um, then the second very important point is that if you want to do well, and I would say, even enjoy the experience, you need to devote time to it. And this is an academic exercise that places you in a unique position to really work together with a team of people and go in depth into a particular field of the law. And this will be useful for you, not only to acquire knowledge on WTO law, but to acquire a set of tools that are going to be essential throughout your professional career as a lawyer. So I highly recommend uh, that as coaches, we sort of try to transmit those tools and use the opportunity to assist students in improving or enhancing those tools that will make them better professionals in the future, regardless of the area of the law which they practice. Um, specific to this competition, of course, is the next recommendation, which is being familiar with the dispute settlement understanding. So as this uh, exercise is a uh, fictitious case trying to simulate WTO dispute settlement procedures, you need to be very uh, knowledgeable about the procedural rule book, which is contained in the DSU. So that's why we really suggest that the students and you as coaches uh, devote time to explain the students what the DSU is, how it's structured, what rules it covers, and that will uh, for sure equip the students uh, to participate sort of more fluidly in the competition. Uh, another advice is that team members must stress the part. So this, of course, is true as for any other activity in life. You need to really get into the role 
and that requires preparing yourself for it. And in this competition, you have two layers for that. You have the written submissions, so that entails the students becoming good writers, uh, being effective writers. Uh, Colofello will be providing some specific advice on that in a moment, but also when it comes to the oral advocacy, um, also training themselves to be good advocates for the causes that they're trying to lead in front of the panels. And again, as a life skill, this exercise is extremely interesting because teams would need to prepare to plead on both sides. And that's always a good exercise when analyzing legal issues because it requires you to think from the other side's perspective and really assess the strength of the arguments and the weakness of your own arguments. So that's quite useful as a process of enhancing tools that will be useful in the exercise of the legal profession. And last but not least, and this is my favorite point, mooting is all about teamwork. Uh, I used to tell my students an anecdote that uh, some of them laughed about, which is that once watching one of these big uh, Hollywood blockbusters that's called Annapolis, I don't know if you've ever watched it, there's the scene where the drill sergeant tells the platoon, you need to understand that the platoon is st as strong as the weakest of its members. And that really stuck to me because when you're talking about teamwork, it's crucial that everyone is up to scratch. And in the competition, regardless of where you whether the team is going to excel or not, most likely everyone will excel if they devote the time and prepare themselves. Uh, to me, it's about cooperating and working together towards a common goal. And when, from a competitive perspective, you look at it from that quote, uh, it really helps motivate the students to help each other because it's not seen as a process as, oh, I'm competing with the others to be the shining star and get a... Um, uh, scouted to work at this big law firm or at the WTO or at the ACWL or whatever, but it's more about really working together towards having a very uh, enriching personal and professional experience in the academic setting that will equip you to become better lawyers. Well, the students, of course, and also the coaches. I mean, I as a coach think that I improved a lot my skills uh, when guiding this process. So. I would leave it there. Probably uh, Olofello might want to supplement some of this uh, general advice on her own experience or others. And of course, your questions are absolutely welcome uh, for us to share our experiences on this front. And we we'll probably now move to the next slide where I'm going to give you some general advice for the oral pleadings. So uh, we've arranged this a little bit the other way around, because normally you would start with the written submissions. As Jakub explained, that's what comes first. But just not to break the flow of the presentation, uh, we decided to first talk about this as I'm going to do this. And then uh, Colofello will move on to talking about the written submissions. So um, Elsa has done a great job at providing support materials for competitors. So amongst those are pleading guidelines which provide very useful advice and explanations of how each of the sessions are to happen. And I highly recommend that you visit those and go through them carefully uh, in understanding what it takes to participate in each round and how you can best prepare for that. This includes the demeanor on how you're expected to address the panel, how you're expected to address the other party, and other things of the sorts. So uh, I highly advise that you check those out. And of course the rules as well, because there are certain behavior that is uh, forbidden and it's important to know what it is so that you avoid doing any of that uh, during the process of delivering your overall pleadings. Uh, another second element, which is crucial and is also extremely important for the written part is knowing the case. So having a very thorough knowledge of the facts uh, also of the law, and this entails, uh, well, and in addition to that, the jurisprudence as well, because as Vedlana was saying, uh, in the WTO dispute settlement context, there's a big body of decisions that support the process of interpreting and applying some of these provisions, so it's extremely uh, useful for you as an oral advocate to know the law uh, and those aspects of the law sufficiently well so that you can engage in a conversation with the panel. Another advice is 
that you need to be aware that in the time that you have allocated, you are not expected and won't be able to deliver the whole extent of your arguments in the level of detail that you might be able to provide in the written submissions. So don't uh, expect to be able to do that and don't prepare to do that, but rather condense the key arguments that you want to uh, take across to make the point that you uh, are seeking to. Um, uh, useful advice in this process is prepare the students so that they're able to present the arguments and explain their arguments in the first sentence or two, so that the main idea or the main takeaway is clear from the outset. And only as the argument progresses, sort of the other uh, supporting elements are developed. As a strategy, it's generally suggested that you lead with the strongest arguments. And this is also clearly attached to not being afraid of acknowledging the weaknesses either coming from the facts or from the law, because sometimes the law is on your side, sometimes the facts are on your side. And trying to hide that is absolutely not useful because in the end, the panel has a very good knowledge of what the critical issues are and will go directly to those because what, that's what's more interesting. So uh, lead with the strongest arguments and not hide any weaknesses, but engage with them in a way that allows you to move on with your strong points. Uh, this one that comes next is something that I used to repeat to my students all the time, which is understand the session, not as a process of interrogation or examination by the panel of your knowledge, but rather as a conversation. So it's a conversation amongst educated people on a topic that the students have studied in depth. So if you approach it that way, it's much more interesting both for the panel and for the students, because if the panel has heard already three or four times the same pleading and they just listen to the same script over and over again, they're not able to get the nuances of the degree of knowledge and preparation that each team might have if they, instead of repeating their script, engage in a conversation with the panel. So that's something that I tend to underscore to students to really pay attention to. And of course, that requires a, a lot of training and practice because uh, for people who are experienced in oral advocacy, it may come sort of naturally, but that's something that you build as a skill. So, of course, this requires several repetition and uh, practice rounds for students to enhance this skill. Uh, another recommendation is do not argue with the panelists. So sometimes it's tempting to ask well, or sort of to react to something that a panel might say in a way like, no, that's not right or well, whatever. But the panel generally comes with a question out of a genuine uh, concern or idea of something being problematic on what's being said. And attached to that, I would sort of repeat um, suggestion that a uh, famous uh, Jeff subject that I forget his name right now, used to give us at the time, which is don't cling to rocks. And that's quite meaningful because sometimes if you stand up there, or well, in this case, if you're sitting there making your argument, and you're so attached to it that you don't let go, you're gonna lose all the time uh, of the presentation trying to go over the same points. And that's not going to be helpful. So it's important for the students to understand that if an issue or questions about an issue arise repeatedly, if you give the same answer, uh, the questions are not going to go away or the concern is not going to go away. So it's important to really think about what's being asked and be prepared to reply to it. And again, this requires a lot of preparation because it requires the students to have seen a set of potential questions and prepare a set of potential answers to those questions that can be readily available in their minds to address this type of issues going forward. Um, another good advice is if you make an error, just concede and move on. We are all humans and sometimes either our memory or knowledge or some other aspect may get in the way of uh, not answering or not providing a correct answer or the answer that's expected at a time. And if you notice that, well, just indicate it and move on. A good example of this is if someone asks you about a case and then the person doesn't know whether there's a case, the person can very confidently and naturally answer uh, at this point, uh, Mr. Panelist or Madame Panelist, I'm not able to assist you with a case on that. And as part of the teamwork, the person who's on the 
bench sort of supporting the other uh, speaker uh, can quickly research within the notes that you have with you or if they know the answer uh, write it down and perhaps you reserve that for the rebuttal or the sorry bottle and before presenting it uh, you quickly go back to the question that was asked and address it or at a later stage in the presentation and this is something just to, to maintain the flow and uh, notes well or Make the panel understand that you're hearing what they're asking. You're concerned of providing answers to that. Uh, another uh, advice, which is very important, is that rebuttals are crucial. And they're crucial because it's the last thing that the panel is going to hear from you. And it's the opportunity you have to really pin the weak points of your counterpart, of what they've said in their arguments, and shed light on your stronger points. So it's very important to prepare not only for the general pleading, but also for the rebuttal and so rebuttal and try to think ahead what possible arguments would the other party make and what type of rebuttal would we provide in that context. And the same with a so rebuttal, so that it's not something that's sort of prepared on the spot, because despite how much of a genius a student can be, it's very hard to really on the spot come up with good points to address. Whereas if you practice it in advance, and already have sort of a set of possibilities prepared, you just make use of that and sort of allows your brain power to uh, pick rather than develop. Um, another advice is to be confident and make eye contact. Again, this is something that has to be worked on in continuously practicing the rounds. Another advice is to speak clearly, audibly, and watch your speed. Depending on which part of the world you're from, uh, people have a tendency to speak faster. I come from Latin America, I'm Colombian, and back home, we generally speak very fast, very emphatically, and sometimes not to, uh, we don't vocalize too well. So we need to work ourselves a lot in being aware of what quirks we have that may make it difficult to get the message through. And that's, uh, as a coach that I used to have for the Jessup, something that he called the cosmetics of a coaching, which is not really the substantive part of developing the arguments, but really taking care of preparing yourself adequately for how you're going to present it. And that's quite important as well. Uh, teams may, teammates should work together and time each other. Uh, within the oral round itself, teamwork is also very important. So the idea of everyone being sitting as part of a delegation as happens in real lives is to mimic that aspect of teamwork and it's passing notes to each other it's supporting each other in understanding what's being asked how to move around uh, the questions and of course watching time because time is one of the most difficult aspects that happens in this type of exercise or that needs to be handled in this type of exercise uh, in terms of what the panelists will ask you, it's also important to prepare a list of possible questions and their answers. I think I've already sort of mentioned this, so I won't uh, repeat myself. And lastly, rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. It's all about practice. So practice makes uh, the master. And uh, I invite you to practice a lot with your students. If you as a coach are not able to practice with them, invite them to practice with their uh, fellow students, with their family members. Uh, I find it extremely helpful with the students that I've coached to ask them to plead with their siblings, with their parents, with their cousins, because when you make the speech or the presentation to someone who knows nothing in terms of the law, you really test how clear you're being and whether that makes sense to an uninformed uh, audience. And it's a very useful way of boosting your confidence and helping yourself rearticulate and organize your pleading in a way that makes sense. So rehearsing is not only about rehearsing with the coach or the academic counselor, but with many people in many settings. Uh, and that I think is extremely helpful. So uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have in the Q&A session. I will now uh, give the floor to Colofello, who will address the written parts of the advice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miguel. Um, 
And uh, don't worry, we're almost at the end of the formal presentation. So I know some of you might be dying to ask some questions. So in a few minutes, you'll be able to engage with us on those questions. Um, I am going to deal, as, as, as Miguel said, with the written submissions, some general advice for the written submissions. And um, I also want to be corrected by Jakub and, and Louis. I believe that those written submissions take up 30% of the score. Is that correct? In the preliminary rounds, at least? Um, yes, it usually takes 30% in the preliminary rounds. Uh, uh -huh. However, in the past year, when we had to move to the virtual platform, it changed from the 30 to 50. So it was even more um, important. Okay, so this is exactly the point that I wanted to make. And um, a lot of people, not because they don't want to do well in, in the competition, blow off the written submissions for many reasons, because they are due uh, early in the year, so in January. Um, for some students, it's just, it's just after or in the middle of their written exams. Um, some students are on summer holiday, especially at the Southern Hemisphere. Um, the teams that I've, you know, worked with in the Southern Hemisphere, they do not have time to be writing submissions for a mood court problem. And in the end, uh, unfortunately, really, really sadly, it affects their performance at the oral stage. Because by the time you submit your written submissions in January, um, and then you have your, your, your oral pleadings in March, April, or whatever it is, depending on your region, you would have had accumulated so much knowledge and experience in those three months or four months that you have in between and you're a completely different person when you do the oral pleadings and when you write and there's some students look back in their written submissions with horror like <laughs> they're like oh my god what were we writing and I, if, I really congratulate you for coming to the session because you have to start preparing now a, I know it's a lot of information and it's very overwhelming especially all those tools but it's really for you to go back and to get acquainted with the WTO websites or whatever those things that we showed you so that you can feel comfortable using those tools. When the case comes out on the 15th of September, you read it. You know, if you just spend the first week just getting to know the case properly and getting acquainted with the terminology, you know, especially if you come from a university where you don't have a trade law course. I mean, it's not impossible to participate if you don't have formal knowledge or background in trade, you can, of course, but you do need to put in a lot more time than those people that have the benefit of, of having a trade law course. So this is just for your knowledge. The written submissions are very important, especially as Jakub just mentioned, when they move from 30% to 50%, they could actually make or break, you know, your participation and how well you do in this, in this competition. So as always, make sure you know the rules. Um, I've graded submissions and I've seen how some teams did not comply with the rules at all. And just like with anything, I think just aesthetically looking at a document that looks good, it really puts you in a good mood. If you look at a document that does not follow the form, that has a lot of titles, you know, that just doesn't look good, you're already starting to grade that written submission with some sort of a bad mood. So you don't want to, you know, put something as, as, as form and an aesthetics, you know, to work against you. So really make sure that you read the rules. There's examples of old written submissions on the ALSA website, which are excellent. So you literally just have to copy and paste and look at those structures so that you can follow the structure. So make sure that you have that on your side. Just follow the rules. As I said to you before, read the case a number of times before even starting to ink anything. Do not try and write anything before you know that case backwards, you know. A, make sure that you understand the legal issues. Make sure that you have, you know, all the questions that you have in your mind. Start reading. Start researching, you know. I mean, it's just like anything. I'm sure as law students, you do a lot of papers. You do a lot of research. So it's the same type of concept, you know. Know what you're working with. Go back and do the research, and then only you can start um, drafting your, your submissions. And just like, as I said, identify the relevant WTO agreements, uh, as Satlana has explained to us, you know, identify the jurisprudence. And as Miguel explained to us that at the end of the case, sometimes there's an indicative, you know, index or a list of cases and, 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 and materials that you can, you know, look at preliminarily. This is not everything. And I know some teams tend to just rely on those few cases and few journal articles that have been recommended. No, this is just sort of 
your general starting point, and then from there you expand. Okay. So I mean, if you, I mean, as Miguel said, you're going to get out of this as much as you put in. You know, if you're going to put in the minimum, you're going to get the minimum out. Of course, research, research, and you cannot do enough research. Um, I think, you know, submissions, good submissions versus great submissions is just in the way that you've used the case law and, 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 and the law and knowing how things have been interpreted. And I mean, WTO law is very specific and very, can you still hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, somehow my, my screen has blanked out. Okay. We're able to see you and hear you. you yeah, but I, <laughs> I cannot see the screen for whatever reason. Oh, Lord. Okay, hold on. A, <laughs> I don't know what happened. Okay, thank you. I have sorted myself out. Sorry for that. Oh, no. <laughs> All right, uh, don't be like me. Research, research, research. And make sure that, um, as I was saying, you know, a good submission versus a great submission is just knowing how, um, you know, a certain term is interpreted in case law. And you know the people or the teams that have read the case or are familiar with the law, they will use the right case. They will use the right interpretation and not only rely on the WTO text, which is great, but they also sort of supplementary interpretation that has been made in, in jurisprudence for this reason. So please use it. And of course, as a sort of a, a starting point, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not trying to, um, how do you call it, uh, advertise any book over the other or whatever, all these books are equal. But a lot of what I do is, you know, with my students is really, if you want to get the basics and a really good grounding of what's happening in a certain area, you start with a textbook like this. There's other ones, right? I'm just showing you one example. And this is the Fan and Bosch textbook. All right, um, so if you really want a background of, you know, whatever issue, it could be agriculture, it could be SPS, the case, you get into a textbook like this and you read the background. And then moving from there, you'll see, you know, what cases can I look at? You know, what can I, what other material can I look at as well a, to, you know, to gain your understanding and to bolster your arguments, right? Because for some students, this is the very first time they, they're dealing with WTO law. And of course, you need a lot of support for you to be able to write convincingly because the reader doesn't know you, the reader doesn't know where you come from. It's just, we just see a team number. So, you know, you have to impress the reader and you have to be convincing in what you're writing. Obviously, it's very good for you before you start writing, it's just to have an outline, you know, just, you know, your intro section, you know, and then the first uh, argument, uh, or your first claim, and then, you know, you put everything down so that you know how to structure. And as I said, you just go and read the rules and you also look at all submissions to see what they look like, so that you can start populating your outline and then you, you start writing. And a good method is, is a method that we all sort of learn in law school. And in my law school, it was called IRAC. So <laughs> I don't know, I know in some law schools called IPAC. So, you know, the issue, rule, application and conclusion. Um, it depends, you know, I think it's very much a, a stylistic way of how you're going to write. Of course, you don't have a lot of space. I think it's about 35 pages, something like that, to go and, you know, put a whole exposition of the law and which case was, you know, talking about this and what the appellate body said. You have to be very, very concise. But of course, what you have to do is you have to put out the issue, you have to put out the law in some way, and then your application. And of course, in the application, you can then on the case law, but you have to be very sort of structured in your in, in your analysis and, and in your in your writing, and then you have a conclusion, you know. So read the submissions that 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 are on the ALSA website. They're very they're very good because they show you different styles and they show you that there's not one way to do it, but many you know different styles work as well. Just make sure that you adapt adopt a style that makes sense, that is structured and that works for you and your team. A, one of the things that I learned at, at law school uh, from uh, my first intro to law teacher was that, a, you know, what sets apart a good lawyer from a bad lawyer, especially in writing, is the three C's, clarity, being concise, and being correct. Uh, so I think, and, and, and a lot of uh, students may come from legal traditions or from languages where, it, you know, it's very much verbose. So I know, for example, a French and, and Spanish um, 
tends to be a lot more, you know, there's a lot of what we call this verbal fat, a lot of, you know, sort of extra words that you would never necessarily use in English. And so, but when you write obviously something in English, you have to be very precise. You have to be very concise and, you know, cut away all of these sort of filler words that take up space in your submission because then you're just going to run out of space. So, I mean, obviously what you're going to do is read and read and read and read and cut out all of those extra words that you don't need. And I can tell you um, from just reviewing many of these submissions over the years, it does, it does not impress the reader to sound, to use, you know, excessive legalese, if I may say that, you know, the wherewithal and wherewith to and um, you know, those type of words don't add anything to your submission. Um, you know, you're better off not using them at all. And, you know, the more clear and more concise you are, the better that you, you'll perform and you're the better marks you'll get um, in your written submission. Uh, this is just sort of a, a no-brainer, right? You have to make sure that you cut out all of the typos and, you know, try and get somebody who has a good level of English to review for grammar, you know, right? Because not everybody has English as a first language. Um, so, you know, if you, if you have a friend who's, uh, you know, a native English speaker or somebody who speaks English very well, a, you know, ask them, you know, to sort of review your submission or, you know, you have to review and just, you know, you're, you just have to go over and over and over again. Make sure that um, your, 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 your team has got a, a good submission. Finally, um, use a formal tone. Uh, you know, you would never in, in formal writing use contractions like don't and can't. And it's, you know, as a possessor, you know, um, or it is contraction. Uh, simple English, as I said, simple words. Uh, you know, one thing that uh, for any writing that you ever in your life will ever, uh, you know, embark upon is short sentences. A, sometimes, you know, we have paragraphs that are, you know, a sentence that's a paragraph long, you know, many, many lines. Uh, but it's something that you really, we advise, uh, you know, I would give you that advice to, to, to check on the number of words that you have in a sentence. Um, as somebody that uh, back, you know, back in the day when I was a lawyer, sort of in, in my training as a lawyer, um, one of the partners told me that if your sentence has more than 20 words, <laughs> You have to ask yourself what's happening. But I mean, obviously, it's it's very literal. Like you don't have to sit there counting one to 20, but, you know, kind of give the sentence, uh, you know, a good sort of length and, and don't have, you know, sentences that are like, you know, 50 words long. And yeah, sort of correct grammar and, and punctuation, of course. Um, I mean, all of these things, you know, for the written part is a, is a lot about language and is a lot about expressing yourself well and knowing the law and, and knowing the, you know, the facts very well. So that is all from the written um, submissions. And yes, we look forward to, to, to reading them. <laughs> well, uh, thanks so much, uh, Colofello, uh, for, for your very useful presentation. And now we open the floor to any questions that you might have uh, here. As you can see from the slide, you have the contact information of Louis so that he, you can go up to contact him in case you have any questions. Uh, so I see that Jose Rivera has a question. Uh, Jose, would you like to take the floor? I'm just going to unmute you to see your answer. There you go, Jose, I think you're unmuted. Would you like to take the floor or would you prefer that I read the question? Okay, thank you very much. Good good morning from El Salvador. Um, my question is, well, first of all, thank you very much for your very well explained and detailed presentation. This is the first time that I'm attending this um, event or proposal of event, and I would like to thank Thagwiria and Helen Chen who invited me to attend it. My question is very concise and is whether it is possible to have access to videos of moments, rounds of the competition to appreciate the dynamic of it, especially for first timers like us. And thank you very much for your time and attention. Thanks so much for your question, Jose. Perhaps I'll give a first stab at answering. So uh, if you go to Elsa's Facebook page, 
you will have a recording of this year's final round. It's not the traditional type of round because it was held virtually. So you will see a bit awkward in terms of it being a screen with different faces, more or less how we are now. Uh, but it's useful because one of the teams, if I recall correctly, was sitting together. So that already provides you a view of how one team being together in one room would look like. And uh, I think that there are older recordings. I'm not sure whether Elsa has them or in the WTO. We have some of them, but I will be sure to ask around and see whether we can publish some of them either in Elsa's website or somewhere in the WTO web. And we will let you know. I don't know if anyone else from the panel would like to uh, mention something about this. There is, uh, as Miguel said, some recording that's uh, findable on YouTube, but the quality is not as good as it could be. And I will, I will mainly focus on on the the, the recording of the previous uh, the eighteenth edition. Indeed, even if it's online, still the the recording is way better, uh, and it's one of the gold to find those materials in the future. But indeed, the previous year was the best for sure. Before we go, I will uh, post the website uh, of Elsa so that you can easily find it. Um, so I hope, Jose, that this uh, fully answers your question. And is there any other question? Please feel free to, to ask. I have just put in the chat uh, the Elsa Facebook page. So uh, there's here's now a question of Kanikei Kasibekova. Apologies if I didn't pronounce the name correctly. Uh, let me give you the floor in case you want to ask the question. So now you have your microphone open. If you want to ask the question, please go ahead. Uh, hello. Um, yes, it's totally fine. My name is Kanda Kay. I'm from Kyrgyzstan. So thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, one of the questions that I had is like you've mentioned that there are certain um, fees related to the participation of the competition itself. Um, and um, I was in I was having issues like how far is that if it's going to be like not online but face to face um, because of the financial related issues to travel and, and um, etc. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kanike, for your question. Uh, I will let Jakub or Louis answer that question uh, as your best place for that. Um, okay, so if I understood correctly, the question is about the fees in case of a digital uh, edition. And in this case, there will be only the submission, uh, the application fee, which are up to 250 euros per team, uh, the fees for the original rounds and for the final round in case of non in-person edition will not be existing. They will stay only the, the, the all, only will stay the application fee. And if I make uh, a complimentary comment, uh... It's been discussed, and I imagine that Elsa will soon make an announcement in terms of that happening or not, that there may be a possibility of some sort of fee waiver of or funding in cases of teams with financial needs. So there might be a process for an application for such type of waiver where you justify what's the financial need and what's the degree of the need. Uh, and of course, something that teams have done in the past, and here I'm talking from personal experience, in some of the teams that I coached is that many times universities don't have sufficient resources to support students to go to these uh, competitions. So we ended up doing fundraising ourselves, uh, either directly from sort of raffles or parties or that type of social event where we would gather support from friends and family. But also sometimes local law firms are interested in providing financial support. It was the case in the first year that I coached that we were very lucky to get uh, a substantive financial support from a law firm. 
which included also something that was extremely helpful to the team, which was um, the support of a coach on communication. So the law firm had a coach for the associates and the partners, and they provided some time of that coach uh, for the team so that they could uh, enhance some of their abilities. So I just share this with you because sometimes when you are sort of thinking of participating on this or not, it seems like a huge obstacle, especially financially, if you have to travel far away and it's quite costly. But uh, there are possibilities to find support uh, locally um, or even internationally, or you could uh, then make it to, to the final round or to the regional round as a starter. Uh, I see there's another question from Shuaib Rahim. Miguel, uh, if, if you if you allows me to to just uh, yeah sure just sure a small before, comment. Before. Thanks a lot. Uh, about uh, situation of some teams being in financial difficulties for, for for the fees by itself. Indeed, as Miguel said, uh, we are working currently on on having possibility for them to apply uh, to a waiver of the fees. Indeed, and we'll communicate on that uh, through the social platforms and on the website. So yeah, on the same date as the launch of the competition. Those informations also will be will be provided. Thanks so much, Louis, for the clarification. So, sir, sorry, Miguel. Yes. Uh, can you can you had another question in the chat about which regional round Kyrgyzstan would belong to? Maybe Elsa can um, address that one. Absolutely, Louis. If you want to take that one. Uh, I'm going to uh, the, the the rules cake is then sorry I uh, will go for the Asian regional round in this case uh, and we are currently working on the splitting and the potential of the region also but the location will be announced on the 15th of September but yeah the the teams co coming from this country are going to the Asian region thanks so much Louis and we have another question from Sohib Rahim. Uh, I don't know if you would like to, well, I'll give you the floor just for you to uh, make a question. So now you have the microphone open. Um, thank you very much to everyone for the amazing presentation and the time. Um, I just want to also thank the organizers for last year and uh, with the most trying circumstances, and I think it was very commendably done. Um, it was just in terms of planning for the regional the, uh, rounds uh, in terms of our you know, university planning, because we operate a little bit differently in the southern hemisphere. So, but I understand the moment that the dates are around, um, we'll get them on the website on the 15th and we'll plan accordingly. So I'm covered. Thank you. Thanks so much uh, for that. Uh, Professor. Uh, Edna Ramirez, who is coordinating the Americas round, uh, just introduced a comment. So I will, uh, in addition to her comments, give her the floor in case, Edna, you want to say something. So you have your microphone open, Edna. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. My, my, mute, uh, my mic is my mute. Uh, thank you very much, Miguel, and thank you very much. To Sorry, sorry, sorry. Give me one second. Uh, and thank you very much for, for giving me the floor. And uh, congratulations for organi to you all for organizing this uh, event. No, I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm just, uh, I just wanted to let my, my email available for these uh, students that are interested in participating in the All Americas uh, Regional Round in case uh, they face difficulties of any type, like please free, uh, feel free to contact me. I'm also part of the academic board and we are precisely here to support you or uh, of, uh, in if you have any type of difficulty. One of them is normally the coaching. Last year we had the uh, tremendous pleasure of uh, having uh, the support of uh, remote coaches. I mean, we didn't have a record as a coordinator. I couldn't uh, function as a 
as a coach in my own university here in, in Mexico, in Guadalajara, uh, or the University of Guadalajara, but I'm based in Puerto Vallarta, so it is very <laughs> difficult to find someone. Uh, so remotely, we had other coaches and we had a lot of support. So we can do the same and we can try to find coaches for these uh, students that are willing to participate. My daughter is here, sorry. Uh, so yeah, just feel free to write me and then we can find solutions for you guys. So we're just here to help and to encourage you and participate in this very, very, uh, stimulating exercise. Thank you. Thanks so much, Edna. And I will absolutely echo what Edna was just saying, what Professor Ramirez was saying in terms of, uh, don't shy, be shy in reaching out either to Louis or to any of us in terms of finding support to participate. Because as Professor Ramirez would say, this is a large network of people who support the competition and many are willing to provide uh, virtual coaching support. Uh, so please do reach out in case you need any form of support in helping out the process and we'll try to connect you with a person who might be able to help. I don't know if there are any other questions or if any of the other panelists would like to say something at this point. If, if I may, Miguel. Yes, of course. Um, so I, I did not participate in this mood court competition. I think I would have been horrible anyway, but that aside, <laughs> uh, I've been a, uh, a coach uh, one or two times and I've been a panelist uh, quite a number of times. So I really appreciate you know the work that goes into this competition, and 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 you know you know just 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 sheer effort that that students and coaches put in to make all of this happen. And of course, Elsa and 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 the WTO and and other supporters of this competition. But what I wanted to say is, if students really have an interest in in trade, you know, going forward, this is really a competition that that facilitates access into into the trade world. And I think more than any other moot court competition that I've at least been in, involved in, to be honest, I mean, there's many of them. So if you really want to get into trade and if you really want to, to see a career in, in, in this field, um, I really encourage you to take this seriously because, you know, the people that you're going to meet, the people, the panelists, uh, you know, are people who are working at the WTO, people who work in trade, people who have got you know the means and access for you uh in your future career so really i encourage you and i mean there's there's many people including one of the panelists today who can attest to this um you know mood court being a, a propeller of people's career into this field um and so just putting in a plug for this mood court not because i have any shares in in, in also whatsoever but because i've seen what difference it can make in people's lives Thanks so much for that, Colo. I, I completely support what you've just said. Uh, see that there's a question on the chat, well, on the Q&A. So Esa uh, is asking, how can we get the recording? Uh, we will either share it by you with you by email, as I sent you the invitation to with the link to this session. And we will also report on the Elsa's social media. Uh, I'm assuming we can, of course, coordinate that with Louis. And I offer that, uh, thinking that it's possible, uh, to let you know where it's going to be uh, available. Uh, I don't say it definitively because I'm not sure about the technical side on whether we will download it and upload it elsewhere or what's going to happen, but we will for sure let you know via email or through the social media platforms of ELSA. So please look out for it. We'll do that hopefully in the next few days. I will put in the in the chat the link for the LinkedIn page uh, freshly created and which we will add uh, this recording uh, also. I think it's one of the most easiest way for you to get in to, to, to get this one and to share it. Uh, of course, the mail also is, is really a good option, so both are suitable. Perfect. Thanks so much, Louis. Uh, so, yes, we will share the recording. And uh, are there any further questions?
thought. Uh, so um, I would thank especially our speakers and of course all of you for attending. Uh, to me, it was a very enjoyable session and I hope it has been uh, helpful to, to everyone. And uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We are here to help as much as possible. So thanks again, everyone. Goodbye. I'll yield the floor to the other uh, panelists in case they want to say goodbye. Thank you, everyone, and good luck with the competition. A lot for attending this session and good luck. Thank you very much for taking your time to attend. Um, I just wanted to remind you again if you're interested on the one on one um, session, please do get in touch with us and let us know, and we can organize that one on one coaching session with the coaches. Uh, as everybody already said, good luck and uh, thank you for coming today. So take care, everyone, and we'll uh, post the recording shortly on the upcoming days. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you.